As a financial planner, I have to start out with some investment advice uh, for members only. Uh, this is, uh, if you had purchased a thousand shares of Gulf Airlines several years ago, you'd have a uh, thousand dollars of shares, I mean, you'd have uh, forty-nine dollars today. If you purchased a thousand uh, dollars in shares of AIG several years ago, you'd have thirty-three dollars today. If you purchased a thousand shares in Lehman Brothers uh, several years ago, you'd have zero today. But if you had purchased a thousand dollars, I gotta get through this. <laughs> if you had purchased a thousand dollars worth of beer one year ago, drank all the beer, then turned in the aluminum cans for the recycling refund, you would have received two hundred fourteen dollars. <laughs> Based on the above, the best current measurement of current investment plan is to drink heavily and recycle. <laughs> it's, it's called a 401k plan. <laughs> also, a recent study found that average American walks about 900 miles a year. I didn't know it was that high. And another study found that on average, Americans drink 22 gallons of alcohol a year. That means that the average American gets about 41 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Makes you proud to be an American. <laughs> but at the outset, that I belong to no political party. I am independent. So I don't want you to try to stereotype where I might be coming from uh, as you hear me. Uh, these are times that try men's souls. And this is indeed as descriptive of today as when Thomas Paine uttered those words during our revolutionary period. When preparing for my annual 4th of July speech at the Speaker's Corner tomorrow, I decided to talk this year about American exceptionalism because we hear a lot of, about this these days and I wanted to get an understanding of just what it is. For example, Mitt Romney has accused President Obama, in his words, of not having sufficient faith in American exceptionalism. And the president has responded that American world leadership is one of the many examples of why America is exceptional. I'll break this presentation into several parts and then make a suggestion for the future of our country. First, I'm going to try to define somewhat what it is. Then, what it isn't. I will challenge it, but not attack it. Thirdly, uh, what the Declaration of Independence might suggest to us now, today, along with some founder statements, and finally, what I am concluding. 80% of Americans believe in American exceptionalism. So what is it? The concept has been around since the Puritans hit our shores. God ordained a shining city on a hill away from the corrupt Church of England. It has taken on great currency over the years, especially since World War II, since we saved the world from tyranny and we won the Cold War. Like art, however, it is in the eye of the beholder, or rather the speaker. To some, it is a belief. To others, it is the country's accomplishments. To me, it is in action, not belief. Our forefathers have had, among the entire world, an opportunity to begin a new country and a democratic government by a collection of 18th century world's best and exceptional founding fathers. They were well educated in the classics and the enlightenment. They knew all the prominent scholars and theoreticians of the ages. And importantly for us today, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors in the cause of separation from their colonial masters they, uh, to establish a new nation under God. They make this pledge in the last line of the Declaration of Independence and they sign their traitors' names to it. I've often wondered whether our contemporary leaders would pledge their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to the legacy that they have inherited. The founders created an exceptional constitution, as Jean said earlier, used as a model throughout the world, especially since the aftermath of World War II and in post-colonial southern hemispheric areas. They were men of disparate political persuasions, but unlike today's Congress, they knew how to compromise. 
For an independent study course that I took in college, I had to read Madison's Notes, which is a huge coffee table size uh, book compiled by James Madison each night in his hotel room noting the proceedings of the convention that day and in violation of Constitution uh, secrecy rules. Every article in our great document, he noted, is a carefully worded compromise hashed out in secrecy over the course of a long, hot summer in Philadelphia. The most familiar to us, Gene's already mentioned, the large state, small state compromise for congressional representation. And the most flawed is that of counting the slaves as three-fifths of a person for the Southern representation purposes. But I assure you that nothing in that document was not a compromise. From men who had seen government under the Confederation fail for the reason of uncompromising sectional factionalism. The Constitution has stood the course of time and tribulation and stands today with relatively few amendments thanks to the brilliantly established concept of judicial review using a standard called repugnance to the Constitution. When asked what accomplished at the convention's end, and this is important for today, Benjamin Franklin stated, we have got you a republic if you can keep it. With manifest data's destiny, God ordained according to contemporary leaders, our ancestors conquered a continent, taking out the European and Mexican land holdings, subjugating the native tribes of Indians, and creating room for expansion of a growing population and the development of wealth. Even the crisis of the Civil War did not destroy the government established by it. Moving forward, we're blessed with natural resources, well exploited indeed, and our world-class industrialists and bankers have created the best industrial capacity and capital markets the world has ever known. So that by the 1980s, the United States had half of the world's gross domestic product. Of course, we have the best military in the world, spending as much on our military, industrial, and congressional complex as the rest of the world combined. We could beat any aggressor in a classic land, sea, air-based war. All in all, just look at what we've been so fortunate to inherit. The best of everything. And this indeed is the basis of American exceptionalism. But there's one more piece to this definition that has been propounded, sometimes from the pulpits and sometimes from the politicians. And that is that we have some God-ordained right to be the greatest nation in the world. One student of the Bible recently told me that it was even prophesied in the book of Revelations that we're told to be that we were, we were to be the greatest democracy the world has ever known. And these ministers in the audience, you, you tell me, is that in the book of Revelation? No. no. <laughs> when I read that book once, at least, I didn't see USA mentioned in it, but uh, this person was adamant it was prophesied. And um, the other night I had Butch Henderson explain it all to me, so it, it's all there. But anyway, we are exceptional indeed. Our system, as flawed as it may be, for anything. But I do not look upon our contemporary life with rose-colored glasses. And I'm thankful to be able to use my First Amendment right to express some flaws in this concept of exceptionalism. By the way, the First Amendment was not one of the compromises of the Constitutional Convention. It was the first ten amendments were the price of getting it uh, uh, passed by the various uh, states. For example, not too long ago, pre-World War II, Great Britain thought itself exceptional. And it was. It had the greatest empire the world had ever known, spanning the globe. But it lost its title of being the most exceptional nation shortly thereafter. At one time or another, so was France, Spain, Portugal, Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire, Rome itself, and the cradle of democracy, Greece, as well as various empires of the Middle East, Far East, and so on, all exceptional at one time. Yet they all became unexceptional. And they had three things in common prior to their fall from exceptionalism. As we heard from our guest speaker from Cal Poly several weeks ago, the civil engineer, one of them was infrastructure decay. For example, when the Visigoths overran Rome, Roman held France, they got a lot of gall. 
and they didn't know how to tax the population. I know only two people in this room got it. It was a, it was a, it was a bad problem. <laughs> they didn't know how to tax the population, and the natives were happy not to be taxed. Terrific. Yet as a result, over time, French roads, water systems, and sewage systems set up by the Roman legions fell into disrepair. History tells us that another factor was overreaching with the military, as the cost of containing colonies, including material and troops, became so burdensome with colonial uprisings and such that a tipping point was inevitably reached. Great Britain lost India shortly after World War II. The Union of South Africa, which I visited as a merchant seaman in 1958, was gone by 1960. And the third element that all who lost their exceptional status was factionalism in the governing structure, a paralytic disease indeed. As I mentioned earlier, the reason the government under the Articles of Confederation failed, and as Chief pointed out, there was no common currency, no common trade and commerce agreements, no common taxation to support the purity of the country. Now, as I ponder these three factors and see them occurring in our own contemporary situation, which could possibly lead the United States of America to become unexceptional, I came across uh, a piece by Yale Doctorow who wrote an uh, essay, I guess, on how to become a non-exceptional country. And this is what he said in a condensed form. Even though the Constitution leaves election disputes to the states, had the Supreme Court suspend the counting of ballots in a presidential election and appoint the candidate of his choice as president, invade a non-terrorist country and manage the war so that the results are indeterminate, order secret surveillance of citizens, mine their phone calls and emails, make records of any business, medical facility, library, etc. available to government agencies, and perform illegal warrantless searches of homes and offices. Torture terrorism suspects in violation of constitutional rights. Disregard the Geneva Convention and the Convention Against Torture. Commit to indeterminate detentions. Suspend progressive taxation so that the wealthiest pay less proportionately than the middle class. Ensure that the country's wealth accumulates to a small fraction of the population so that the gap between rich and poor widens exponentially. Cut taxes and raise wartime expenditures so that the national treasury is depleted by debt, requiring austerity. This so that the national and state and municipal legislatures have to cut back on domestic services, ensuring that there will be less money for education, health, veterans, infrastructure, libraries, and the general welfare. In economics, this is known as start the beast. Number seven, deregulate the banking industry so as to create a severe recession in which enormous numbers of people lose their homes and jobs with no penalties to the bankers to cause it. And finally, pack the Supreme Court with like-minded justice, justices to facilitate all this. In the second phase, you have the Supreme Court rule that corporations are people too, even though they lack the range of feelings or values that define what it is to be human. Nor can they be incarcerated. For example, if you rob a bank, you go to jail. But if a bank ruins the economy, they get a bailout and a bonus. And that, while humans can act against their own interests, corporations cannot. Corporations' only purpose is to produce wealth, regardless of social consequences. It is profits over people. To be really unexceptional, a country would have a third phase as follows. Give corporate control of legislative bodies. Enact laws and regulations that benefit corporate interests. A little more on this later. Privatize prisons whose profits increase with inmate incre as inmates increases as long as they're filled mostly with minorities. Treat immigrants as criminals. Deplete and underfinance public schools and transfer the function to private, for-profit corporations. Make higher ed unaffordable for the middle class. Inject religion into public policy, for example, control women's bodies. Prohibit or restrict collective bargaining. 
restrict voting rights of some people, as has happened in certain southern states, most recently in Florida. Propagandize against scientific facts that would affect corporate profits. Portray global warming as a conspiracy by scientists. Finally, portray the national government as unwieldy, bubbling, and containing elitist liberals. Create mental states of maladaptive populism among the citizenry to support this view. <coughs> to be really unexceptional, an additional phase would have your top court increase police powers so they can strip search anybody for whom they, whatever reason, decide to retain. Authorize drones for local police departments, which the FAA has recently done. And this would complete the definition of an unexceptional country. Pulling this essay over and thinking about our founding documents and our great legacy, I decided that if this were occurring in our country, we would need to change our form of government from the plutocracy that it has become back to a democratic republic. Here's a little refresher from the Declaration. An exceptional document indeed, perhaps the most exceptional document in the history of the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons. And accordingly, all experience has shown that man would rather suffer than uh, rightly suffer the sufferable themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are coming. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. The Declaration went on to list grievances against the Crown of England. And in that spirit, I've listed a, a number of grievances that I think that we share with our current state of governments. After the successful war for independence, the fledgling country attempted a confederation with a weak central government, which failed the common interests of the nation. So the new constitution and government were developed. When they asked what the Constitution Convention had developed, I think I said earlier, Benjamin Franklin said, we have got you a republic if you can keep it. We haven't kept it, I say. So using the rationale of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, it is time to change what we have now. Back to the future, so to speak. The form of government has changed from the rationale of the Declaration and the Constitution. What was set up as a democratically elected republic is now a democratically elected oligarchy. That is, corporations have taken complete control of our government, both legislatively and administratively. Yes, we still vote for representatives, democratically, who no longer represent us once elected due to the complete control of them and the government by corporations of various stripes, corrupted as it is by money and power. Now, when corporations control any government, that is by definition, and you can look this up in Webster's, that is by definition a form of fascism. I do not think that's what the framers had in mind. Our original founders may have been well off financially, owning businesses and plantations, and there were certainly regional interests in legislation. Although corporations have always had influence, corporate control of elections and the levers of government is a more recent phenomenon that began with the deregulation of businesses starting in the 1980s and through every successive administration. There are agencies like the OCED that track country corruption and other measures. The bad news is that we're not among the 20 least corrupt countries like our neighbor Canada. The good news is that we're not among the most corrupt on the list. 
According to a May 2012 Gallup poll, 60% of Americans believe that the country is corrupt in both business and government. Let me give you some examples and abuses that have come with them in similar format to the Declaration. Healthcare has been privatized, and through industry effort, Congress authorized 30% of insurance company revenue to be allocated to overhead and profits. The heads of these companies make multi-millions of dollars a year, and premiums are increased regularly to maintain this. Whereas the taxpayer-funded Medicare is under attack both by the industry and its allies in Congress, because it only has a 4% overhead and cannot raise its rates easily to keep up with rising costs. Therefore, some in Congress want to privatize it with a voucher system to be used in the private um, system. This is against the best interests of the people. Among major English-speaking countries, we rank last on healthcare system performance based on measures of quality and price. And I heard a politician say just the other day we have the greatest healthcare system in the world. Similarly, the drug industry has gotten Congress to prohibit the government from negotiating prices for Medicare Part D. It has decreased regulatory funding of the FDA so that even though 80% of the drugs are manufactured outside the United States, there are not enough inspectors to enforce quality standards. All this is against the best interests of the people. The chemical industry has successfully lobbied Congress to prohibit regulations that would affect people's health. When the EPA was formed in the Nixon administration, the 50,000 chemicals then in existence were grandfathered for regulation. And of the 24,000 new chemicals created since then, only 400 have been tested for safety. And of these, only five are regulated. Many of these chemicals are known to cause cancer and brain disorders. All this is against the best interests of the people. John Quincy Adams once proclaimed, America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She's a well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She's a champion and vindicator only of her own. This guided American war policy, with minor exceptions, clear up to our times until the Bay of Pigs fiasco in the Vietnam War. Since then, the military industrial congressional complex has been able to engineer a continuing growth of the industry. We are now engaged in maintains a permanent table of organization. Now, to have a war, you, you, you need funding. But in Vietnam and in Iraq, Taxing people for needed revenue would have garnered no support for the incursions because they were not defensive in nature. Thus, massive borrowing occurred, which led to high inflation in the 70s, actually stagflation, and will lead to high inflation now. Yet this time, the problem was compounded by cutting taxes and adding trillions to the debt. As a financial planner, I cannot imagine suggesting to clients that they both decrease their revenue and increase their expenses for living uh, beyond their means. As of 2009, we had over 1,000 bases elsewhere in the world. And as with Great Britain and Rome, we are overextended, perhaps to a tipping point. Again, profits for people. The club bulletin describing the speech mentioned that we have a specific world mission to spread liberty and democracy. But look at our most recent foreign policy decisions. Although the Egyptian military has abolished a democratically elected parliament and curtailed the powers of its democratically elected president, we continue to give them millions in military aid. Because to stop it, they would cancel the weapons contracts they have with American companies. Likewise, Pakistan continues to receive billions in foreign aid for similar reasons. Even though they harbor terrorists who attack our troops and block our supplies from getting into Afghanistan. And we continue to give aid to other countries that suppress democracy. Too long a list to mention here. In my last talk, I reported 2010 data that said 55% of the federal discretionary budget went to the Defense Department. And an additional 5% or so 
goes to the private military arms of the CIA and the State Department. And yet we have little money budgeted for infrastructure. According to our civil engineer professor speaker uh, last month, there's approximately $2.3 trillion in infrastructure needs. And he pointed out that said decline in infrastructure historically presages decline in civilization. And the education system declined, which we heard from in part several weeks ago from the Mount SAC president, uh, Dr. Scroggins, are part of the infrastructure, another element in our race to the bottom, not to the top. We are 38th in world education standing. There are 12.8 million active unemployed in our country. 3.74 million job openings that aren't filled. And many uh, research and tech positions can't be filled by our own citizens because of inadequate education. So the business interests now want to increase the immigration quotas from India to fill these positions. And our impoverished area unemployables are a time bomb we need to defuse. Wall Street corporate interests successfully got Glass-Siegel Act abrogated during the Clinton administration, which had prohibited banks from certain uh, dangerous investing activities. With further decreases in Wall Street reg regulation, we were handed the 2008 financial debacle that according to the Federal Reserve has decreased the net worth of a middle class by 40%. In the year 1929, 250 banks controlled roughly half the nation's banking resources, and 7,000 banks controlled the rest. They're now gone. With antitrust enforcement down drastically, now only six banks control almost 74% of the nation's banking resources. And that's why they are now too big to fail. Tax structure. Only one in 189 high earners pay any taxes. And the same for corporations like Apple, GE, and Google. These freeloading loading people want the advantages of the United States and yet not pay their fair share. And of course, this tax structure is a product of our Congress. Almost all of them are millionaires. I could go on and on about how various corporate interests have take, overtaken the interests of the people through government profits over people. The water, the food, the environment, natural resources. The result is, we're, is hurting we the people, not them. We have changed from a market economy to a market society, where every public good is for sale to the highest bidder, cheapening social good and demeaning representative government. I imagine you may have some grievances of your own, but suffice, suffice it to say, in one way or another, the national government is not now of, by, and for the people, but of, by, and for corporate interests. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, every government, no matter how exceptional, should experience revolution from time to time. We have indeed experienced a revolution in our lifetime. It began in the 1980s. And in the following 40 years, having inexorably devolved our government to a corporatocracy with concomitant corruption, we indeed meet the criteria of losing our exceptionalism. Corruption has weakened the social mores and trust in our representative government that were the glue of our exceptionalism. We have huge infrastructure neglect. We have overreached our global globe militarily. We have a fractious Congress and nation. I remind you that Madison's notes tell us that our founders were exceptional compromisers. And look at Congress today. I say it's time for a counter-revolution. Back to the framers intent, that shining example of a democratic republic. To repeat the declaration, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And I want to tell you, so long as the American people believe in the principles of our Declaration and Constitution, 
our exceptionalism will endure. My solution, I have stated in detail in my last presentation here, uh, seven points to revolutionizing our government. I can't see the clock, though. What, what have we got? Ten minutes. Quarter after? Yeah, we're quarter after now. I'll go through these points only briefly because I gave a whole presentation on them before. Number one, we need to step back from predatory oligarchy control of our government and have our elected representatives work for us instead. We have to have public financing along with campaign limits so that our elected representatives are not so beholden to corporations, including the corporate controlled media. We must end gerrymandering of election districts. We must develop a national industrial policy if our great-grandchildren are to survive. The growth needed for jobs in the future and in line with industrial policy, we should spend about 1% of gross domestic product on basic research and then prohibit the outsourcing of manufacturing the results of that research. Basic research got us, among many other innovations, to the moon, which got us new industries and mega thousands of jobs. Number five, we need to institute a fair tax system. Notice I said system, not income taxes. I'm not talking about soaking the rich and redistributing the money to the unworthy. I'm talking about facing and funding our national priorities fairly. We need to reinstitute vigorous antitrust enforcement. This too big to fail is nonsense. And the growth of military expenditures must be greatly restrained. restrained. The Libertarian Cato Foundation has listed over 1.1 trillion in cuts over 10 years that can be made without adversely affecting our national security. But even if we cut our military budget in half, we'd be the most powerful military nation in the world, always able to defend ourselves. And we could then address our own infrastructure and debt needs. And we wouldn't spend ourselves into a second-rate military as did England. Both of these points, and stopping the degradation of our environment and food supply, are in our national security interests, as is controlling our national debt. To quote Robert Redford, defense of our natural resources is just as important as defense abroad. On with the counter-revolution, I say, and in the words of the great colonial patriot Patrick Henry, if this be treason, make the most of it. And may God bless America, and may we be exceptional again. Thank you.